but uh so once that happened in school was there like what what was it like in school like d- with so in people? school to be honest with you i was bullied up until i was probably in college oh, so because of hearing loss I, so the first thing to do for a deaf child is to teach it its language which is natural to it so i only had 18 18% hearing in this ear mm-hmm. and when they do the surgery whatever hearing you have it's the possibility of it going so that was a week we're in the music business yes we uh what a cool thing to say <laughs> we I are i mean for most people it's cool yeah uh we're in the music business but what we don't realize most of the time is that there are people out there who i mean we take it for granted that like 100%. oh we just play music and then everyone will enjoy it and and whatever we're playing everyone will enjoy i take it for granted that everyone will enjoy it uh but that's not always the case i think it's also just the fact that i feel like as a world we're trying to get more inclusive yeah but what does that mean when like it's such a basic saying right music is universal and it is but it's not a universal experience which is our convert some one of our conversations for today And we have the the perfect person to talk to about this and so much more yes. today on the pod. We've got Areej. Woo! Welcome, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here today and I'm very excited to share my story and um also share what you just mentioned uh, how I actually experience music. Uh, so um Honestly, I feel like just last weekend I had someone asking me and they were like, "Reesh, so you know like and I I do have a really close friend of mine and she's always asking me. She's like, "Reesh, you know, please tell me what is it that you actually experience? What is it that you can actually hear?" Because obviously with a hearing loss and having a cochlear implant, I mean a cochlear implant, it doesn't cure or fix anything it's kind of like a device that supports you to hear better than you could without it and again it's electronic so think about it that i have like a microphone somewhat on my head to an extent and it's helping me be able to have an access to certain sounds again the sounds that it can access maybe more within the low frequency range and it's very few channels that it covers So obviously someone with uh hearing we don't like to use the word normal because there is nothing normal in this world is what we strongly believe facts are facts and everyone's different because there are people out there with a slight hearing loss and hearing loss is a spectrum so i'd say someone like me with a significant hearing loss and someone who has a hearing within a certain range they would experience music very differently where they can hear literally every sound every frequency every vibration where someone like me is more focused on depending on the vibration that it's providing me with so you'll find a lot of deaf people do enjoy dancing and you'll find a lot of on google that there's people out there that can actually dance and they are deaf and people are like wow that's amazing how do you do it because i do strongly believe that our other senses are heightened so the way we feel anything like even when you go to like a sound bath and it's such a meditative experience you literally feel that sound it literally goes through your body and you are able to get to a frequency of meditative which is state of mind i also feel like the hope of practitioners of sound baths is they want that to happen and like it's exactly, happening exactly because yeah. otherwise it's just coming through one of your senses right when you wake up all of your senses you're able to get to a certain point and you're able to actually feel the vibration and dance to it so mm-hmm. i feel like i'm someone who does enjoy music and i think that's quite a common misconception that i don't um but there's certain kinds of music that i would particularly enjoy over others right like what could you share sorry like the beats i'm assuming yeah um I'd say it's not so much about the lyrics unless the background sound is reduced to a point and it's within a certain frequency where I can actually enjoy the lyrics. So I it's so strange but I found like sometimes our Bollywood mu- music is actually a perfect example of that. And I don't feel like I just like Bollywood music, but they do that where they actually make sh- try to mostly have the lyrics come out. 
and the beat behind sort of goes with it in nice. support is how I've experienced it. Whereas I'll find a lot of like whether it's pop, it's rap, it, it's more about the sound and the sound is over. It kind of like the lyrics become the background. Right. And then you don't actually catch the lyrics or someone like me doesn't catch the lyrics because the sound is so overbearing that you, you're you just enjoying that really. So like you, I'll often be around somewhere and the friends can literally hear all the lyrics for song and I'm like, I might hear certain words because you have to remember that speech has its own frequency as well. Absolutely. So Every person, when they pronounce a letter or a sound, it has its own frequency. So depending on where that is on the, on the audiogram, which is how sound is basically calculated, that would be converted into sound. And you'll find that a lot of the pitches and sounds would somewhat go over that. So my hearing doesn't cover the, the speech range. But uh, is that the same for uh, people speaking? Because a lot of people speak at different baritones as well. That's right. So there would be the very, very high pitches would be harder, I'm assuming, or easier? They would be harder. Harder. Yeah, 100%. Uh, they would okay. be harder. Okay. So someone like me can't actually cover the high pitch. So good. Sabah and I are both. On I was very literally <laughs> just going to say. Low baritone. So this is going to yeah. be. <laughs> This is going to be easy. I was going to say it makes sense sitting with these two dinosaurs <laughs> barking over here that it makes sense right. that we're able to hang. Um, right. Thank you so much for explaining that because, again, it's just something people don't think about that there's literally science and biology and so much that's behind the way we hear. I mean, some of this I've never heard before and that's fascinating. That. But it's also like we didn't have to think about it then the way that people experience Absolutely. it. Absolutely. And and it's uh, it's amazing that uh, for me, I uh, normally we play music and then we expect that, oh, people will get a certain feel, certain emotion from the kind of music that we're playing. But it's I have never actually dug in deep and found out uh, as to how different people will experience that music differently and you've given me a whole new perspective so uh, we were actually talking about this off camera and I really I'm excited and I really want to kind of dig deep deeper and and work with you on some really cool stuff which stay tuned I was gonna say cross promotion yeah. 89 <laughs> podcast it's gonna happen okay now let's get into you ma'am <laughs> tell us a bit about you tell us a bit about uh, your story and with hearing loss and how we're sitting here today. Origin stories. Origin es stories, yes. essentially. So um, I like that. now <laughs> to begin with, I mean, like uh, my story, uh, is, I mean, tailoring it around my hearing loss. Uh, I'd say I was diagnosed with a hearing loss when I was around three, four years old. And again, detecting and diagnosing hearing loss, it's not easy to do that. Uh, because sound travels in waves and it's like even with your grandparents who notice suddenly the remote control volume's going up until it doesn't go really up you're mm -hmm. like oh something's not right yeah um or with anyone because with vision light travels in a straight light in a straight line whereas with sound it travels in waves right right so Someone can be saying something and you just mishear them, but you won't be like, oh, this person actually is struggling to hear mm. until it happens a significant amount of time. And you spend a lot of time with that person. And I do require, I think it requires education to be able to diagnose and awareness. So, so how it was detected for me was when I was going to school. So I went to school in the UK. I was literally born and raised there. I lived most of my life there. And that's why I'm like, sometimes I do think, and I'm like, if I lived in Pakistan, what that could have actually mm, been facts, like, yeah. that True. probably would have been very different as well. Um, so I was diagnosed with a hearing loss and then I was provided with hearing aids in school. And I remember not in school, but from school, they send you to a hospital and then eventually you, you're given hearing aids. So I used to have hearing aids in both ears. And I remember the first time I was given my hearing aids, I was like, I am not going to wear that. Yeah. And I don't know. It's like you're too young to know if something looks nice or it doesn't look nice. Yeah. But that's also something going forward I want to change. 
Right. And that's why I feel like the work that I'm doing today is something very close to my heart because as a child I don't think I should have had to feel that way. Right. Yeah. And I felt like it required a lot of learning to love myself so that I could accept my hearing aids. But basically hearing aids are designed to camouflage. They're designed to be hidden because unfortunately there's a lot of stigma around them where people think when you get older you start losing your hearing and that's when you wear them. And honestly speaking the only person I knew that wore hearing aids at that age and that time was my next door neighbor and he was in his late 70s. Yeah. Right. Okay. And it's unfortunate but I did not know any other child my age or someone even 10 years older than me with hearing aids. Yeah. There is like there aren't people in different age groups wearing hearing aids. And that's why I can probably have this idea that I associated with okay so like it's something maybe people for certain age category would be wearing this why am I being given it. And then even today I have like even uh, some of my uh, uh, aunties and uncles and my friends grandparents they've been diagnosed with a hearing loss and they're like no I'm not wearing that. Mm, so, yeah. so I don't blame them and that's why I do in, going in the future want to sort of change the perception of hearing loss and hearing devices um because I feel like it was the same stigma around glasses at one point but yeah. we've worked a lot with in collaboration with the fashion industry I to actually I was just going to say like Warby Parker made people that don't have vision loss be like, I want to wear glasses. Yes. Like, I want to be part of this. <laughs> there was a point when we were in school, there was a point where growing up, some of the kids would just wear glasses even if they didn't need it. They didn't, it. yeah. Because it was a fashion statement. Exactly. Right? Uh, did When you were, when, when, when they gave you the hearing aids to wear, did anyone talk you through it? Did anyone explain, like from the doctor to anyone in school? Or was there anyone who talked you through the, the whole process or talked you through it? Um, as to why you yeah. need it? Uh, I mean, I think at the age of five, again, you don't really understand things, yeah, to be course, honest. Yeah, and I think maybe if it was given to me at a later age, maybe I would have. And I don't think back then there was some kind of like counseling or coaching, which right. definitely would have been a better approach, even being in the UK. Right, yeah, right. Sure. And now I think that there might actually be. Because now people are trying to be a little bit more inclusive and they're trying to like educate people about what, and also now uh, I think even families and and, and uh, when it comes to like schools, families, doctors, everyone is, is making a conscious effort to actually try and at least teach people about why you need it, why you should be wearing it. And it's, there's nothing wrong with it. 100% and I just hope that it continues to go that yeah. way. Yeah. You know, a lot of these younger shows that I've been watching on Netflix, like I'm sure you've seen it, like they're basically like non-insane versions of Euphoria in a way where it's like just normal, like New Zealanders. I think one is called like Heartbreak High. Another one is called this. And I see this push for inclusion where, yes, you do see people with hearing aids just being kids, like literally they don't have to explain it and it's just understood that some children and some adults not just seniors also use hearing aids yeah. or you know one thing i saw in particular was glasses that have bands around the back because people don't know that sometimes it's not just vision loss it's related to some other things that are going on with your cranium literally and i thought that was really fascinating too that they're just trying to which is the reality of the situation is that people are just people. But I have to imagine, I mean, you were a 90s baby, I'm assuming. Yes. Yeah. 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 That was a very, very That's tough a tough, time. Tough, That's tough. a tough time. I mean, tougher. Yeah. I mean, if you talk to kids from like before that, it was even harder. Yeah. I think it started getting a little bit more normalized as the decades went yeah. through. And by now, everyone's very, very open to all kinds of uh, uh, things. But uh, so... Once that happened in school, was there like what? What was it like in school? Like d with so in people? school, to be honest with you, I was bullied up until I was probably in college. Oh, so because of hearing loss, I do think that I think so. Bullies, obviously, they're actually going through something themselves, yes. right? So they'll find someone that they can actually pinpoint at and pick on. 
and then Is someone the with something different, unusual that they weren't familiar with, becomes a very easy target. Right. It's their own insecurity. Yes. That they then project onto other people in different ways. Exactly. We- and I think so. Basically, imagine I was diagnosed in primary school and I didn't wear my hearing aids because I didn't accept myself. I didn't learn to love myself. Sorry, I don't mean to, just because I'm curious, did they hurt or were they designed not to at that point? No, they didn't hurt. Okay. They just, even now, the perception hasn't significantly changed. Yeah. It's still very much there, but I feel like mental health, to an extent, the awareness of that has changed yeah. and the fact you need to learn to love yourself yeah and i feel like that's where the grand break kind of comes in my story yeah. where i actually learned to accept myself for who i was and i was like you know what i read this is who you are this makes you who you are you've had it for majority of your life you need to accept it because honestly speaking till you don't learn to love yourself how do you expect others to love you absolutely yeah. so sorry i did cut you off there but you were saying that these kids wherever they are now may they run into a sharp corner every day were bullying and bullying and so it was acceptance that sort of made you be like get out of here i'm not dealing with this or how did school respond to that so back then honestly i felt like i kind of i, I mean usually at that age, so basically it was mainly done in high school and i feel like teenagers their uh, hormones are like all over the place you're being very and i made a huge these bullies, <laughs> i made a huge mistake of going to girls only school as well and that was my own mistake and when you put girls together they're just like cruel there are movies <laughs> there's so many movies on that and it's we still whole, don't learn i do feel genre. like when it's a mixed school somewhat the boys kind of balance things out and it tends to be very different but with just girls honestly it does get really crazy right and i feel like eventually um i kind of i feel like i have usually been a very patient person mm-hmm. and i think at that age you don't really know what's right and wrong but you don't want to be a snitch right where you're constantly mm-hmm. going and complaining and constantly something's happening to you and then i think at the same time as a child you do want to make your parents proud right. so you don't want to go home and be like to your parents oh by the way this is what's happening to me and i do feel like being from a south asian home somewhere you're supposed to be strong tough like you know you just kind of get on with it so you you're like everything's fine everything's okay and then i think until eventually i changed schools so in that school i basically failed my a levels and i re- took my a levels in another school which was mixed and at that point is it when i actually kind of had the courage to tell my parents like, you know what i kind of survived high school mm. it was horrible and yeah. i was bullied literally throughout and then that's with my sister so my sister went to the same school and she's like courage i didn't even know what to say mm. You know, like I didn't because I do think bullying back then was really bad. Brutal because there it was, was really bad. You didn't have phones to pull out and call someone out. Essentially, you wouldn't take a video of it. It yeah. wouldn't make it to social media, so you right. don't actually know what was happening behind and closed doors. Also, I think a lot of people normalized it, yeah. uh, where it was like a rite of passage to get bullied and get through it and get to the other side. But like now, I mean, we we normalized it. We went through it, and then we like now now, now that we're older, we're like, oh yeah, I went through it and I got through it or whatever. But we what we don't realize is that we just kind of just push down all that trauma, 100%. and then it comes up much later like for all of us you know like it's i don't think i was tri- bullied as bad but i also think because i was bigger than a lot of kids so it was like i lit not to bully myself right now but i'd squash them you know what i mean i'd sit on them and squash. but you're right because the particular moments where somebody went out of their way to just belittle and degrade like you, you exactly you're kind of like yeah it happened and then you sit there and you're like the minute I even sense this in like my adult life peeking out, it kills I mean, me. You think know? about it. They've made movies on bullying in high school. High school, it was the place where everyone got bullied yeah. and it became like a normal thing, hmm. whereas it's not. And this is an episode that we should totally I was have just say, as a whole yeah. separate episode. Um, hmm. Tell me a little bit about when you moved back. When, when did you move back here? So 
I never really moved back, so I've never actually lived in Pakistan. Yeah, so oh, moved okay. Here. Moved so here. I was born and raised in um, London, and I lived there for most of my life until just before COVID. I moved to Dubai. Right. So my background is basically in education. Okay. So after I graduated from my computer science degree, I decided to work in the corporate world for a year, and I just decided it wasn't for me. I wanted to do something a bit more meaningful and different. And um, then at the time, the government was offering you uh, the opportunity to do a postgrad where they pay you to become a teacher because there was a, um, a shortage of teachers mm-hmm. in the UK. And they particularly were trying to push the computer science subject. So back in the day, it used to be called ICT or IT. Yeah. Now it's computer science because they, they know the kids know how to use a computer. They want people to make computers. So it's all about AI and uh, giving Very instructions cool. to something and algorithms. So then I was like, you know what? I want to do something more connected to people. So that's when I decided to become a teacher. And then I ended up in Dubai for about three years. Oh, wow. So just under, so about a year and a half ago is when I left Dubai. I was teaching computer science there in elementary school just after spending three years teaching in London at a high school. And I feel like, just like I mentioned, I felt like I was bullied in high school and I felt like my experience of getting educated and learning was very challenging. So I do feel like I would sit at the front. I'd be that child sitting at the front while the class is going, throwing chaos at the back. Mm. And I I was just like, you know what? I, I wish things were different. And then I felt like as I became a teacher, I became what I didn't get and what I didn't have to right. an extent. Nice. That's and really like I, a goal, right? Like that's fantastic. Yeah. To be able yeah. to do that. Because it's not just for yourself, it's for them. For yeah. them. Yeah. Exactly. So literally I and now so far, while I was teaching the UK and Dubai, I would always have that one child that maybe we're hearing aids now or couldn't hear, or was autistic, or had ADHD. There's So when you be- train to become a teacher in the UK, they try to make you an all-inclusive teacher, mm-hmm. where they train you on all the different abilities of a child. And you tailor a lesson. You've got 30 kids. Every kid's on a different level, and you've got to plan the lesson for them. That's amazing. And a great I- time to say teachers are very underpaid for the amount of work they do because that's incredible i totally agree with that and then so but in dubai honestly life was amazing and i felt like i was doing great but a point came where i felt like i wanted to do so much more right and i wanted to take a break to actually think about it so my dad was in pakistan and dubai is just like less than two hours Mm fly over so I was like, Dad, you know what? I'm going to take a break from my job. I've been working nonstop pretty much all my life. So I was one of those people that even like, I started working when I was 16. Yeah. So since I was 16, I've just been working. <laughs> a point was like, okay, I want to take a break. And then I came to Pakistan and I was like, okay, um, let's take a break. And it was like wedding season and I started getting really bored and I was like, okay, what am I going to do with my time now? Bored during <laughs> wedding season? Say, December I mean, like, <laughs> it, it's, it, but then you can do that, right? You want something intellectual to be doing at the right, same time right, to an course, extent, right? And you want to feel like you have some accountability, responsibility on the side as well to give you a routine and wedding season doesn't really give you that. <laughs> no. It just I'm like, the routine everything. is 11 p.m. You start getting ready. <laughs> 5 a.m. You roll in. <laughs> but we... Yes. We get what you're saying. <laughs> 100%. Um, so I... Literally a month went by and I was just getting bored and... Just before I was supposed to be leaving to go back to Dubai, because I was like, you know what, I'll apply for another job and then I'll, I'll get something else. Someone connected me to this organization called Deaf Beach. And I thought, you know what, let me actually go see what it's like and what's happening here. And I went to visit and I remember when I went to visit for the first time, they were showing me all the challenges that they were facing and I saw the wonderful work that they were doing. So if you haven't visited us, please do make the time Mm -hmm. to visit us soon. Um, So all these kids from very underprivileged background, um, 
with smiles on their face and they were learning. Yeah. You know, literally just the vibe and the environment that was created at Deaf Beat was amazing. And I was just like, oh, wow. So when I visited Deaf Beat, I was just like, wow, this is wonderful. And I felt like I had the skills and experience of what I've been through in my life to help them. So I said, you know what, let me volunteer with you guys and help you guys for a short period of time. I said, sure. So I started volunteering and helping them with their curriculum and how they were teaching. And I said, okay, let's work with the foundation years. And we started working with the pre-primary level first, which is KG1 and KG2. And I started working on the lessons and how the learning environment was. So I worked on a, a wide range of things because I was kind of like, you know what, I, I want to have like a clean canvas mm -hmm. and to be able to do literally what I felt like I wish I had. Yeah, And right. I feel like coming to Pakistan, like you can go anywhere in the world, but they already have their canvas ready and you have to follow it, right? Right. And I felt like this kind of gave me the opportunity to do that. Right, And right. they wanted this. They needed yeah. that help and support as well. And literally after a month, I was like, okay, I'm going to go back to Dubai. And they were like, no, can you stay a bit longer? Because yeah. you just started something, you showed us what you can support us with. And I was like, okay, so my... With Emirates, you can only like extend your flight up to certain times. So I said, okay, fine, April. So then I ended up being with them till April. And now I, it's been a year and a half. But honestly, That's amazing. It's amazing. Sorry, could you just tell us a little bit about what Deaf Reach does? Just yeah. for, yeah. We'll also include links if we can, but yeah. yeah. Um, so Deaf Reach is an NGO locally based in Pakistan. And the founders are Richard and Heidi. Uh, and they founded the school like more than 30 years ago now and um, they started it off as a very small office back in Sadr and before you know it it just gained a lot of popularity and um, uh, we they started partnering with the Sindh government with the Punjab government uh, and um, now we have eight campuses across Pakistan. Hey. We're opening a ninth one up north. That's amazing. amazing. Yes. And then we're working on a digital learning program as well because there's one million deaf people across Pakistan. That was literally mm -hmm. going to be my next yeah. question is that there is a such an insane lack of visibility for quite a sizable a portion of our population and people don't know that that it's actually a huge huge number here that just kind of we don't we overlook like the ways that they can be part of things you and know? i do feel like when you go to deaf reach it's like a little bubble yeah. but then if you're creating an inclusive nation there needs to be more accessibility and inclusion for those people to be able to communicate going around. Absolutely. I think that's the one thing that you, when you go abroad, uh, every time I have stepped out, I have always noticed that they try to include people from all walks of life, from with all disabilities, and they try and include them in every day-to-day -day routines. Whereas over here, we kind of overlook that because we're kind of, I don't know what it is, we're dealing with our own issues for so long that we just we kind of overlook all the other things out there and it's it's something that it speaks a lot for our society because i feel like if we do start taking note of all the different types of people and what they would need and start including that in our in our something as basic as you know just going out to the grocery store or going out and basic Doctors routines offices even, or yeah, yeah something something as simple as that have a ramp there for people with disabilities or have gonna say, some yeah. we don't think all of that through whereas abroad when you step there step out you tend to notice all of this and you then you start thinking about it and that's something that's missing over here and i'm so glad that you know with with nine schools i'm sure that's step one step two would be to then advocate and then start talking to the the everyone else out there and and sort of getting the word out there so that they start including it in whatever they're doing well, i would also say that unfortunately and i'm embarrassed to say this as pakistanis i do think there is stigma for sure about mm. you know i'm sure you can agree i mean my mom has been handicapped since i was four years old and yeah when you bring up ramps there was one of the banks we went to the ramp was literally almost like this and she was like, what do you want me to do with this? Like, literally climb it with like a mountain pick. Yeah. 
and the uneven sidewalks and the fact that even government buildings you walk in um and i wish i was remembering this youtuber's name but there it, we do have phenomenal deaf youtubers out of pakistan and i was interviewing him and he said you know it's not enough to just put captions because you're not thinking about like the diverse range of hearing loss some people have never heard language so you're putting yes. captions they don't know what what the, they want sign language they've learned a language that people should learn yes yeah sorry not just be like i mean your thoughts on that because that's something i like that blew me away where i was like yeah there needs to be subtitles everywhere and he was like listen lady that's yeah. not enough like you know so that's basically what i work on okay, okay so there is a misconception that okay you take a let's say for example an urdu book uh, or an english book and you translate it into sign language mm -hmm. but you haven't taught the kids the sign, sign language. language exactly so the first thing to do for a deaf child is to teach it its language which is natural to it now there's a lot of stigma around that mm. so like i said hearing loss is a spectrum there's people who um ha have a hearing loss and they struggle to speak as well right and now if but I feel like parents have this idea that, you know, my child must speak, it must speak. And they put it through dozens of speech and language therapy, which is fine. But I feel like it's like a child on the spectrum of autism as well. And it's struggling and struggling and struggling. And then, I mean, there's multiple things you can try with it as well. Mm -hmm. A point comes where you're like, you know what, this isn't working. You try a different thing, right? And I feel like that's where sign language comes in. But that is literally sometimes a last resort of a lot of parents where mm. they're like, no, because, and I honestly think it's because then the parent has to learn it too. And that's a lot of work and effort for a parent yeah. to do sometimes. And honestly speaking, it isn't easy to learn that language. But once you start, I mean, that's your way of communicating with your child mm. and you're helping it build its communication. Because I feel like in the US now, when a baby's born, you know, it learns to communicate before it learns to speak. Yes. Right. So when it cries, you know, it's crying for something. When it screams, you know, the scream is for something. You're the parent at the end of the day. You figure it out with time. Right. Or it picks something up and it shows it to you. But it's not it's not vocal communication. Right. right? So that's literally what it is with the deaf child. That the child is trying and trying because... And in America, they basically say that, you know, learn baby signs yeah. to communicate with your child now. So it's become a new, fashionable, trendy thing to do. And I do think that generally all over the world, especially in our society and communities while in Pakistan, that stigma does need a lot of advocacy, education and awareness yeah. to sort of drift away from that and actually be like, okay, it's okay to learn sign language. Right. Mm -hmm. Can I just ask, uh, when you did come here and the, with the work that you're doing, every time you meet people, like for example, you came here, you met us, every time you meet people outside of uh, your work, outside of the uh, uh, people that you're generally dealing with on a day to day, and when you tell them about, you know, your life or your work, how, how have they reacted to you? It's a positive reaction. But the reaction also shows me how much education, advocacy and awareness needs to be done. That's why I'm going to say thank you very much for inviting me today and giving me the opportunity and the platform to do this. We, for, us, for us, it's honestly, we, we're honored to have you here yeah. because I honestly... I was when I saw your name on the yeah, thing. I, yeah, I've, I've had the pleasure of meeting Areej socially <laughs> a few times too. Uh, actually on my roof. That, that party! That you were at. Oh, Not that there. we have parties. We are good <laughs> Why didn't you introduce us? Did we? Uh, no. I mean... <laughs> Nobody introduced us. Yeah. This is why I love this podcast because I get to meet people and get yeah. to know about their but lives. But you know, that was when I, I met normally... her the first time. Oh, yeah, same night. Like uh, a mutual friend came that we was thrown for Martha, right? So she, <laughs> m me telling everyone my details, I'll drop my address after this. And so that was like a further group from there. And that's how we met that night on my roof. So that's probably why you weren't introduced. Otherwise, I normally drag... Uh, Please meet. Yeah. And she's like, no, I, this is uh, this is why I'm on this podcast. Yeah. I meet cool people and they tell me about their life. And then, and, you know, we talk about it. And then, and we, then we make you do our 89 podcast also. It's yeah. a real thing. I'm going to drag you right upstairs or right <laughs> no, after this. Uh, but yeah, so, so tell me a little bit about like, so like you said, people are mostly 
okay like they're yeah very i open think they it. have a lot of questions and i feel like i'm a very open book so i'm very open with sharing whatever it is people ask and no one's been like rude or and i think at this age we're a lot more mature we know yeah. how to like you know yeah. ask uh, and so on and like sometimes i mean some of them might find it offensive but like literally people come up to me and they're like oh reach you don't know what that thing on your ear it it looks so pretty <laughs> oh. what is it <laughs> <laughs> and then because you have to remember I don't have a hearing aid anymore right. I have a cochlear implant mm-hmm. and the lack of awareness and knowledge on that is still could you for the sake of everyone else out there and me uh explain <laughs> what how how what what is the difference and how does it is it more helpful is it like what what is it exactly okay so um hearing aids you don't need a surgery right so with a cochlear implant you do need a surgery mm-hmm. so you go through a surgery where there is like a cochlear and they basically implant something inside of it mm-hmm. which is basically what sends the sound messages to the nerve that which then goes to your brain right okay uh, i'm more than happy to take it off and show you if you like <laughs> what you're comfortable with i mean with, whatever honestly, you're comfortable yeah, yeah, with i mean okay. so oh. this is it is really pretty so i've a uh, kind of made it but does it camouflaging right okay. okay so you also notice that maybe my voice is slightly a bit different now as well because i can't 100% hear myself as well so basically this thing over here is a magnet it goes on my head oh. so i have a magnet in my head now it's pretty dope <laughs> here's a microphone mm-hmm. sound goes here there's a battery here Oh sorry I think we're trying to zoom oh, in. Wanna, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Our producer yeah. from the back is like <laughs> giving instructions. So this is what it looks like. Um the battery part is the bottom part here. Right. This is the magnet. So sound basically goes from here through this wire and then there's a magnet on my head. It goes through and it gets to my head. So I don't use my ear. I use this. Yo, that is really cool. I mean, I hope that's okay to say but like that it like the way no, yeah. science and technology. It's, it's amazing. How that's amazing. How that's old amazing. were you when you uh, uh So I'm back now. Yeah. <laughs> okay, welcome back. <laughs> How old were you when you got the cochlear implant? I was 25. And was this um uh, something you opted to do or it was something you had to do? Um so it was a very challenging decision to make because I think Once you do the surgery it's permanent. Right. Okay. So I only had 1818% hearing in this ear. Mhm. And when they do the surgery, whatever hearing you have, it's the possibility of it going. Mm. And then obviously when I kind of discussed it with my parents and obviously parents being parents will be very like it's very risky. Right. It's a surgery, it's permanent. It's bigger than a hearing aid, it, you know, it's what have you. Mm. Um so my parents were kind of like I read like we don't think you should go for it. Mm. But me being stubborn I was just like no because I felt like hearing aids weren't working well enough for me and I was going through a very difficult time mentally yeah. where I felt like I wasn't able to hear things other people didn't know how to support me and it was also the time I was working in the corporate world and I just felt like I had to have meetings I had to talk on the phone which I couldn't do basic right. things like that. I couldn't talk on the phone. I couldn't hear someone and they were literally looking at me. One person was talking at a time. Now, I can talk on the phone and I can hear certain sounds that I've literally never heard before. So like I didn't realize that you know literally like when your hands touch each other and you rub them against each other, that makes sound. Okay. And for me that was quite the experience and I feel like when I tell my parents that now they're like oh cuz they can't yeah. even imagine right that, that's and something I, like Ilham said like we just we take a lot for granted, granted you know we don't realize that there's these little nuances um like for example lip reading when when i'm talking to someone i could be on my phone or i could be distracted mm. and i could still be able to have like conversations whereas when there's people who have hearing disabilities you need to be looking right at them now me as someone who 
would probably never think it through. I have to be very mindful of that, mm. that when I'm when I'm around people like that. And that's something I mean, I learned this when I was much younger, because my mom uh, was working for a uh, an organization that was working with all sorts of disabilities. And then there was a carnival that they had once thrown for like a charity carnival. And I'd gone there and I'd met people with all kinds of disabilities and I was I was very young so it was my first experience and then and that kind of like blew my mind and it opened my mind to all kinds of people and um but then I also have friends who have probably never met somebody with a disability yeah. or because they all everyone lives in their little bubbles and I'm not saying that it's a it's a like good thing bad thing whatever but I feel like I would push everyone to go meet everyone because it takes all kinds in this world um so just be a little bit more mindful i guess you know um, of <laughs> sorry i was gonna say when when black lives matter popped off mm -hmm. you know and that was so many people in pakistan would you know say because i was very i mean look i'm american i also have a hip-hop r&b show right on the radio i cannot say that i do not profit off black culture and things like that i swear the point is related but i remember a lot of people in pakistan being like girl who cares? And I was like, learning of other people's experience yeah. mm -hmm. makes you a more well-rounded human being. I was on my radio shelling show telling people to watch Issa Rae's content. I was saying, watch stuff that has nothing to do with you because learning about other people matters. And by the way, there are black people in Pakistan and there are people with hearing loss in Pakistan. There are people with disabilities in Pakistan. Our Paralympics is one of the most decorated team in the Absolutely. world. I don't know if you, And the, actually I saw this post by someone that was like the Olympics were just that was just warm up. If you want to see you know like the athletes who are really holding their countries on their back and the point I'm trying to make is like building off of what Alam said is like yes it's not you're not a bad person for not trying to reach out of your bubble I guess but I'm also saying what a missed opportunity to live a better like a wholer life wholer Wholesome, like wholesome. <laughs> more, my more diverse wholesome. range life. I'm like, oh, yeah, wow. yeah. So, wh what helps? Lip reading mixed with the implant, mixed with like uh, sign like like what is it? Honestly, that it's a mixture of everything, right? And I keep mentioning the word spectrum because, like you said, that you met that deaf YouTuber, yeah. and he said Pakistan sign language, sign mm -hmm. language would help. So. Me personally, I was n never exposed to sign language growing up mm -hmm. because no one else around me was deaf, not in school, not literally none of my friends were. And I feel like my first exposure to even understanding that there's other people like me out there was when I was a teenager. And that kind of helped me with learning tech stuff myself. But if I had other people to sign with, then that, that probably would have made it a lot easier and sign language yeah. would have been beneficial. Now the work that I'm doing, I'm learning sign language and I do notice that it helps a lot. Right. So even though like sign language is not um, in the same structure and grammar as a spoken language, it's very different, which is why you can't translate word for word. It's It has its own structure and grammar. But what you can do is sort of speak slower, be patient, Right. look at someone and make sure your body language actually aligns with what you're trying to say as well. Because if your eyebrows are down, then it can make an impression. And if your eyebrows are up, and even with sign language, that's actually a grammar focus as well. Um, so I think it's a mixture of everything. And then it, when it comes to education, it's visuals. So like, I remember growing up when I had my spelling test, I would always get them wrong because I heard the word wrong. Yeah, yeah, fair. Not that I got the spelling test wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Me who literally always got C's in spelling. I'm not even, it was my worst grade. So I'm like, yeah. I am still making spelling mistakes. <laughs> okay, so. But it's like, teacher, you knew I couldn't hear, but you didn't know how to support me. Yeah, and right. again, it's not the teacher's fault. There was a lack of training and edu education provided on how to support a child with a hearing loss. So now, in a lot of the curriculum that I'm developing for Deaf Breach, we make sure that we have visuals there. Right. So let's say we're doing, for example, if I was to go back into a spelling test, the teacher could say the word apple. But remember, like I mentioned, sound travels in words. I might hear the pull. Yeah. I might not hear the A. 
I've heard the poem. I don't know what you're saying. Yeah. Because sound is missing and I hear pull. But then if you've got a picture of an apple and you're telling me spell apple and I hear pull. Okay, but she's talking about an apple. Right. So then I know, oh, which word is it? And I'll write the word apple. So so you're working on curriculums for deaf reach. Would you, I mean, e- eventually we would hope that you would take those curriculums and also take them to mainstream schools and take them to, so that, those kids also get exposed to it and those teachers also learn something from it and then also i mean like like you said abroad now you have teachers who are trained for all kinds of uh, kids that they have to teach whereas i feel like in pakistan majority of the schools teachers don't have that training and they're not even expected to be trained for all kinds of kids i think so they're brutal here are- <laughs> frankly here if you're not getting good grades even they're like hate you well, I don't there know. are there are some schools that are adopting different ways so are good. are open to change are open to having teachers and they send teachers for all kinds of trainings but it's still like this much yeah I'm gonna you know yeah. uh that there isn't that much um, but i would hope you that are right so um in fact it's the students are by literally like the students come to school and you can mold them into what what you want you teach them you give some give them something the learn it the grasp it it's the teachers the way they've been taught and what unlearning they have to do right. to be able to now teach in a new Excellent. way yeah and Excellent. i feel like that's kind of what we're struggling in pakistan because we've been going forward with a very traditional way of teaching for a very long time and there is no clear training sort of provided right that a teacher whatever they've been through before they're like this is how you teach and mm. this is it and that's it so i mean you look at a teacher who's been doing it for 20 years and then you tell her hey here are three kids and they're very different to the kids that you've taught before and now teach them yeah. that teacher is going to be like uh i don't know how to teach them and so then your th- child is slow yeah or the they, or they so default to that yeah. and then and then you tell the teacher that you have to forget about what uh, whatever you've learned or or the 20 years of experience that you've had and now do this course and learn something new i understand that there will be pushback but if we, we have to start somewhere right so i feel like this is something this is a starting point us talking about it here and if you are a teacher and you're listening please open your mind up to it and and let's see if we can bring some change out of what we've discussed here i talk about this a lot on this podcast that i see that in pakistan there is and i do mean this about pakistan like i really see it as a problem here there's this real need to conform and there's this need to be the same and fall in line yes and i feel that we treat people with disabilities and um or just differently able abilities even adhd or the way that we process thinking there's a such a lack of patience and there's almost like blame like mm-hmm. they are upset with you and this is not like you were 4 years old you didn't like make a choice that you were like you know what i'm going to make it this much harder for my teacher absolutely not you're literally just a person mm-hmm. and i find that in pakistan that is tough and you know um to ilham's point and yours as well you know these teachers also like I mean let's be honest teaching is traumatic in the, like the way they're treated the way they are the way things they have to put up with and I feel like when you approach them and say hey now we're going to slightly veer to the left they themselves kind of take it personally that like what are you trying to say about me and I'm like I just wish we had a bit more of an open mind to evolution here that you know Yes, something's been this way. It doesn't have to be this way. Like there's 100%. a way to make it that every I mean even I when you're bringing up the pictures thing, Pakistan has a system during elections, right? That you know because we understand that there's a, a literacy rate is violently low in our country. So during elections, what do the government give these political parties? They have emblems, they have images so that you can So what I'm saying is on such a grand scale, mm. you have understood that in to include people, this is one way to do it. Why not apply that in school? Like you're doing it for 200 million people. Right. We're asking you to do it for kids that are in school. Oh sorry, I'm just ranting and raving now, but I'm like, yeah, you know, it no, exists. Yeah, you're completely right, yeah. and it's because of the lack of education. Yeah. So someone simply sitting somewhere in Tiria sitting that will have a very limited access to education themselves as well, just as much as someone who in Pakistan 
uh, where parent might be struggling with what school to send their, their child to would have maybe a similar le level of access except the fact that the deaf child cannot hear whereas the hearing person who's illiterate and from a from interior certain they can hear things yeah so they pick up sound right they might not be able to read and write but they'll be able to hear right so that's kind of where the educational background comes that you are a hearing person is actually learning in the real world and yeah. you provided pictures for them to help them this person has literally almost zero to very little vocabulary okay and this child might also be somewhere in interior sin what's happening to its mental health absolutely isolation absolutely. feeling alone you know yeah feeling unheard and unseen really like man you've got me kind of riled up my damn my blood pressure is like rising i'm like we gotta fix it so you went public with your instagram account you you spoke to people from all over the world what was the reaction that you got once you had so i think that was kind of the pinpoint that got me like reach you can do so much more what i'm sorry before we get into that where can everyone find you on instagram uh so at here a reach yes it's down here somewhere we're going to put it there uh yeah yes here a reach um and i literally called it here a reach because i was like i want the hearing world to bridge with the deaf world right so i want the hearing world to hear me on what i have to say to make the world more inclusive because i do feel that sometimes the deaf community is like one little bubble and hearing world is one little bubble unfortunately i some don't fit in either mm. so i'm someone in the middle and i feel like that's kind of why i've struggled as well so i've never really had friends who because when you you sort of ad adapt to the deaf culture you pick up the language which i never really had the exposure to till now and then in the hearing world you would be able to have a certain level of hearing right mm -hmm. so you're kind of like a in betweener sort of stuck there but that's where a cool you're like thing. no one really understands <laughs> yeah. and no one's actually accepting me or including me into the world you're but not enough it's of kind you. of yeah. like can we bring the two together right so that we can make basically have conversations between each other and actually understand each other a lot more and i feel like that's what i would like to have happening mm -hmm. in the future mm. i really hope it happens and uh i'm really really glad that we had this conversation because it's opened my mind up to a lot more it's opened i'm hoping everyone else's minds to a lot more and uh more power to you man like honestly like thank more you, power to you and you, i really you. i'm really glad that you came back here that you're working with people here and you uh, are striving to kind of be that change which commendable because a lot of people could just go about their day in their corporate jobs and just go go ahead with trust it trust me it does get challenging sometimes of course, <laughs> I was say, of course. Especially, when elam also wanted to add was especially in pakistan especially in pakistan extra hard, but yeah but i mean to speak more about that i do feel like when i feel like pakistan i mean anywhere you go in the world right now considering covid and the pandemic and how times have changed and the financial crisis around the world mm -hmm. and every, anywhere you really go is struggling that's true that's yeah. true. so that's where i kind of make peace with being in pakistan you do have some little simple pleasures of being here too absolutely you know, that you wouldn't be able to so literally i was in london for the summer and uh, I I was so glad to be back. Yeah. <laughs> so I feel like as long as I get that reality check of going back and yeah. then coming back and being like and I know my sisters are a bit envious. So like we're quite a spread family between US, UK and I'm in Pakistan. So um they're like we were so lucky, you know, you don't have to cook, you don't have to <laughs> clean, you don't have to do this, you don't have to do that sometimes, which is some even those people some people would enjoy doing those things, yeah. but so be like listen. guys i may not have to do all of those but here's what i have to do <laughs> deal with people on a daily basis here <laughs> uh before we wrap i actually just wanted to wrap on this because we're going to have the links down below people listening um you talked about you know the speaking slower speaking with a bit more intention eye contact things like that but i was wondering what more can they do to support the deaf community as well as the efforts of deaf reach 
is like I was volunteering a thing like how how do they get involved or at least support okay so um so what can you do to support deaf breach so honestly we are our door is open so we accept visitors and the students actually get very happy when people visit us so we have a campus in Gulistan and Johor which is also where the main head office is mm-hmm. um so we welcome visitors we welcome volunteers so if you feel like there's something that you might want to do so i've had random friends anyone i know actually be like you know what actually i i have this thing and i had this idea and i want to help you with this can i like help you and i'm like yeah sure honestly like we're so open and to help and anyone that's offering anything whether it's funding whether it's sponsorship whether it's donations um honestly we're open to anything so if anyone feels like there's something that they can provide or offer or if it's a small project for example if you wanted to off- provide something to the students at a certain period of time i know that people tend to be very generous during ramadan mm-hmm. because the reward is so much more but literally we are open in all year all year so. all year round Facts. Excellent. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. That's good to know. And I hope you guys know that everybody can get involved down there. Yeah. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us. Honestly, if we do do an episode on bullying, we might call you back yeah. because <laughs> I feel like you've got so you got some stories in the bank that we should probably. I'm like, let's mine your trauma for our content, but it's important because look how awesome you are. Yeah. No, no well, thanks to you bullies actually if any of you are watching, don't take any credit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. No, thank you thank so much. You. All thank right. You. We talked about it. Bye guys.